organizers, Dawn and Lisa, and thanks a lot to Kate for helping to fund this. She did a great job. I also want to thank, uh, I just want to thank the families, and I also want to address the people who are not here with us, either because of medical or logistical reasons. Um, you're with us in our thoughts, and I hope you find these uh, tape presentations of value. I want to give a little structure to my talk. I'm going to review the type and frequency of heart abnormalities, the natural history of some of them, and I know that one of the themes of this talk is kind of comparing Costello to CFC, Noonan, etc. So talk about some of the discriminant features when possible among some of these RASMAT case syndromes. And I want to try to address the genotype-phenotype analysis. Um, I did a little sub-study, if you will, of growth hormone and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and look towards the future um, for some research studies. I looked only at genotype patients. Even though I had done a study of the heart in 2002, I think that's really the past and we have to look towards the future. And so most of my analyses concern the, uh, the patients that are enrolled in Karen Group's natural history scheme. And for the most part, those are 46 patients, in addition to two other patients that uh, uh, have been enrolled by Mike Innes and another patient that had come to me. Uh, so that's 48. Um, my literature review consisted of 74 patients. And these uh, excluded case series. I looked really hard in my detective work to get rid of duplicate patients or just to make sure I have them plugged into just one category. And in some cases, I did contact authors for some supplemental information. So in some cases, I was looking at a grand total of 122. But I will point out when I was talking about the core of 48 or the 122. So let's start out by talking about congenital heart defects. And just as molecular geneticists will show you um, their gene and they'll point out how they categorize the different parts of a gene, I try to look at each of these heart abnormalities with some precision. So when we talk about congenital heart defects, we're talking about abnormalities of structure. And I like to classify them into those that occur earlier in development. And I just list them as earlier. And this means less than four weeks. And few people would disagree that those that um, have to do with laterality, situs, say looping or single ventricles, total trunkal or AV canal defects would fit into this category. So it's less than four weeks. And we could argue about how we would time the other ones, the one that I call later. And this is not the time and place to do that. Maybe those include right-sided obstructions such as pulmonic stenosis, valvar, whether we characterize it as dysplastic or bicuspid, pulmonary artery involvement, subvalvar, supervalvar, left-sided obstructive defects such as coarctation, aortic stenosis, bicuspid aortic valve mitral stenosis, septal defects, aortic, uh, excuse me, ASD secundum or VSDs, anomalous pulmonary uh, venous connection, mitral valve anomalies. The only reason I'm talking fast through them is because this is not the focus of the talk, but how I kind of categorize these. And then when I classify hypertrophy, or cardiomyopathy, which is a big focus of this, I ca classify them in a way that's kind of typical for cardiologists. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy used classically refers to idiopathic subaortic stenosis, IHSS, or asymmetric septal hypertrophy, conveying this idea of kind of asymmetry, which can be obstructive or non obstructive. And they usually convey something that has to do with what are called the sarcomeres. This is in contrast to biventricular symmetric uh, concentric hypertrophy, which is more common with inborn errors in metabolism or storage diseases. And sometimes people just list things as hypertrophy not otherwise specified, LVH not otherwise specified, or just interventricular septal hypertrophy. Um, arrhythmia or disorders of conduction um, can be divided into things that go fast, hecky arrhythmias specifically above or below the AV node. So atrial tachycardias, most commonly SVTs, paroxysmal uh, atrial tachycardias can be used synonymously. Ectopic atrial tachycardias refer to one focus other than the sinus node firing. And highlighted in pink is something very special. Chaotic atrial rhythm, multifocal atrial tachycardia used synonymously. And these above the sinus uh, AV node, excuse me, are different from those below. The ventricular tachycardias, atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter are different mechanisms. Ectopy means uh, premature ventricular beats, premature atrial beats. Heart block, a different entity, and things that you see just on Holter that aren't really causing clinical symptoms are something different. Axis deviation, something that's very common in Newton syndrome, really is really a different entity. And the reason I do this, and I've been asked this at meetings before, isn't just for organization, which is important, but because we want to increase the homogeneity 
other groups that we're looking at so that we compare the different syndromes for comparing things in a symmetric way. And another category of going through three different things would be what we call vasculopathy, small bore and large bore. So we have large arteries, aortic dilation, small vessels such as things that involve the peripheral arterioles, which might include things that cause systemic hypertension or pulmonary hypertension, and even coronary arteries, such as coronary artery dysplasia, fibromuscular dysplasia. And over the years, I've tried to enhance my data collection. So when I wrote my first paper in 2002, I was working with data that had been collected in the 1999 meeting in Birmingham, as well as the literature. And at that time, I was just kind of going for basic delineation of type and frequency of each of those categories, heart defects, cardiomyopathy, and arrhythmia, and just kind of doing basic sorting. And then at the uh, uh, November 2006 uh, CFC Noonan Syndrome meeting, where many of you were present when I presented some of this data, going for better level of definition of the heart defects, better definition of the cardiomyopathy, discriminant value of each of these different things. And where we are right now for this meeting is, for example, for the heart defects, separating out some of the gradient, for the cardiomyopathy, the impact of growth hormone, treatment and progression, and really requiring that I have the ECHO reports to back up all of these things. I have received some criticism from some of my peers and different cardiologists that I absolutely need more than self-reporting. Something that I use in my work in epidemiology, because I also work in public health, is we do something called case classification. Again, it's more than just busy work of putting things and organizing them. Case classification increases homogeneity. Homogeneity should help you enhance things that might have potential developmental interest. So for example, a typical way of just listing things for people who work, say, with um, codes, is you just list things one by one, boom, 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 boom. But when you classify things, the idea is to kind of separate things that are isolated from things that have complexity. And intuitively, people understand this. As we think about some of our children who have the complex hearts, for example, the children who have a congenital heart defect, plus the cardiomyopathy, plus the arrhythmia, Something in you says, aren't they different? And as we know about the mechanism of the RASMAP cave, we know that these are activating, you might say, shouldn't we be separating these out? So here's our first look at my data. So in 2002, uh, when I was looking at them, um, any heart problem was present in 60%. An isolated heart defect was in 75%. If you look down below here, we have six, excuse me, 25% had a combination, 6% had all three. And here we are now with this much better, I think, data purification. I'm looking at a smaller N of 48, but it's much more intensely reviewed. So 80% have any heart problem. Why is it increased? I think more kids are getting echoes. I'm getting a better review of the literature, so it's 80%. But it turns out that this 80% is not necessarily higher for Costello, because I think for all of the other disorders, it's, it's that high. Only 30% have an isolated um, heart abnormality, so I'm including all comers. 50% have some combination, only 20% have what you might call the triad of a, of a heart defect plus cardiomyopathy plus some sort of tachyarrhythmia. Let's go through them one by one. Let's start with the congenital heart defects. So having any kind of a heart defect occurs in about a third, but isolated pulmonic valve stenosis occurs in really just about 10%. And that's very low. In Noonan syndrome, you can have 60%, say, at a Noonan syndrome conference, would have isolated pulmonic stenosis. So, you know, before you get your RAS testing, if you're seeing a baby who has just an isolated pulmonic stenosis and they're edematous and they have some of those more generic phenotype, uh, features, it's less likely to be Costello syndrome. Now, other valve abnormalities do occur in Costello as well as these other syndromes, meaning the tricuspid valve can be prolapsed, the mitral valve, and the aortic. And we get something called polyvalvulopathy. And that really interests me as we talk later on in, in future talks about polyvalvulopathy and some drug that caused polyvalvulopathy. And this is apart from genetic syndromes. And this occurs in uh, Costello syndrome about 15%. And then I look at other things like VSDs, very rare in Costello syndrome, but you see it in the other stuff. And I look for combinations like ASD and PS. It might not mean too much to other people, but you know, you see this in CFC, but you really don't see it in Costello syndrome. Now, it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Any type of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy occurs in over half. 
you know, it doesn't matter whether it's 63% or 66, let's just say over half. And this very severe lethal type occurs in about 14%, so let's say over 10%. Now, it has resolved in 6%. I would not have believed it until I could collect the e echoes to see that. I'm really intrigued by this. I gave a talk to the cardiologist here at, um, at Dornbach yesterday, and I asked them, can you see this in non-syndromic cardiomyopathy? And they were not able to say to me that, yes, you can. Resolution of cardiomyopathy. They were not a cardiomyopathy specialty group. I need to present this to other cardiology cardiologists to find out if this can occur. So I'm, I'm intrigued by this. I know that in this group are some who have had growth hormone. And so there is literature that says if you have growth hormone, those people may have cardiomyopathy will resolve it. So there may be many factors that I need to sort through, but this is intriguing. But there's a whole chunk of patients, 20%, for whom the cardiomyopathy is not well defined. So these in the fuzzy group need to be further refined. I can also tell you that when I used to study cardiomyopathy, I was into really sorting out all the different phenotypes. But as Dr. Zampino, an Italian colleague, has said in his paper, the patterns are very heterogeneous, and I completely agree with him. This is a paper that Dr. Heineck and I authored, and this is based on Dr. Heineck's very interesting research. Before we knew about HRAS, I would say that our greatest interest was in Costello being a possible elastinopathy. And when we think of elastinopathy, we think of Williams syndrome. Costello is not an elastin deficiency. But Dr. Heineck, who can probably describe this better than I in his research, we were thinking about it as possibly being a relative deficiency of elastin and a storage of chondroitin sulfate containing moieties. Um, again, this is not the time to go into this in detail, but this, these two companion slides taken from his paper, um, a paper that we wrote in 2005, show vacuolated cardiomyocytes, foci of abnormal fibrotic tissue. So these were three patients with very severe lethal, or in, in infancy, type of cardiomyopathy. So just as a sidebar comment, cardiomyopathy typically involves what are called sarcomeres. And we see this, it's a clue, is what is called myocardial disarray. We saw it in one of our three patients, it had been reported before, I've seen it in uh, two autopsies since then. But this report was about some sort of storage product, not the kind of storage disease that you see in some of the other storage errors of metabolism, but there's something else going on. Let me move on to arrhythmias. Arrhythmias are very common, almost 50%. Good old-fashioned SVT, something called ectopic atrial tachycardia, meaning it's not the normal sinus node, but something else in the atrium is firing in about one-third. And highlighted in pink is something I want you to know about. We reported this in 2002, and I reinforce it now. Chaotic atrial rhythm, multifocal atrial tachycardia, and the great big series is at least 8%. But now look at our series in the natural history study of 48. 8 out of 48 is 17. That's remarkable. This is rare, and this is very high. General ectopy, just based on Holter, is seen at about 57%. But this is really what I think is very important. If I were, I would love to find a series of patients just with this to see how many have chaotic atrium how many have Costello syndrome, but I've not been able to kind of look at that data. So I ask people to keep this in mind. I'm certainly asking cardiologists to know about this association. And fetal tachycardias, to the tachycardias have fetal onset in about 17%. So we're trying to encourage our colleagues in obstetrics and renal maternal fetal medicine to know about this too. Another little bit of information about chaotic atrial rhythm, also known as multifocal atrial tachycardia. Serious, difficult to treat, occurs in infancy, can be post-operative. Adults know about it, occurs in people with chronic lung disease, people in the PICU. It's diagnosed in EKG because you see more than three P waves. I have little arrows here, and the P wave morphology is quite different. It's an automatic atrial tachycardia. The atria has, is firing in many different places. It's not re-entrant like WPW where you have a cycle going on. And you can't just use little tracings from the NICU. You need really good tracings. Your cardiologists need to be looking. And sometimes it evolves. It might be called SVT one day, EAT, CAT. So it really takes a lot of work. Only by getting these good echoes and cardiology reports and EKGs have I been able to kind of piece it together for our different patients. Vascular anomalies include hypertension, systemic, 
There was one case that I told you about two years ago with pulmonary hypertension, it turned out to be CFC. Aortic dilation in four cases, nobody has had dissection, but it is real, we have to keep an eye on it. One child had coronary dysplasia associated with um, uh, cardiomyopathy. Now, here's my, here's my presentation about genotype analysis. I looked, folks, only at the heart. I actually put blinders on to whether there were other things going on, such as facial appearance and cancer. I really just looked at the heart. I had a bias going into this. I felt that because of what I consider a really striking skew, that 82% have this common G12S mutation. I felt that statistically, I could not see how I could really come to any conclusion. 82% have this, 7% have the G12A, and then the distribution was 3, 2, 1, 2, 1 each for these others. I could not imagine how I was going to find anything meaningful with such a distribution. I didn't even list the things that I looked at because I looked at every per permutation. I looked at the severity of the individual thing. I looked at isolated versus complex. <clears throat> I looked at each of the individual ones that had been discussed, G12B. I compared, somebody asked me about G112A. I looked at each of these to see whether there was a difference, and I couldn't find anything. I know much has been said by other speakers about G112B. Both of these have had the severe phenotypes, but it occurs in all of the others, so I really could see nothing meaningful to say. So at least from the heart point of view, I see no genotype phenotype analysis. No genotype phenotype um, correlation. I'll attend it like that. Let me talk a little bit about growth hormone and its use in patients with Costello and whether there might be anything to say about uh, the change for the uh, development of cardiomyopathy. And it all begins with the report by Kerr et al. in 2003 when she reported two patients one of whom was said to have had uh, uh, a progression of cardiomyopathy with the institution of growth hormone. Um, at the same time, there was embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. And I'll just leave it at that. The literature has not, to me, been too helpful. There are one, two, three, four papers in which there are these patients who had this type of cardiomyopathy and this growth hormone use. These patients had growth hormone cardiomyopathy, but in pink is the same patient. So it's not too helpful. And so I decided not to really, you know, really speak about this and just really to move on. And what I did is I used only those patients in our natural history study. Again, we're talking about 48 patients. And for each patient, I created an individual timeline. Um, I do work in uh, risk factor exposure, so I pretended that I was dealing with a, an exposure. And each patient is given a timeline based on their age, okay, and their, um, their heart. The exposure was growth hormone, and that's indicated in pink. And the phenotype that I was measuring was their cardiomyopathy. So let's look at this particular patient here, and this is the heart. And this is the cardiomyopathy. And each of these represent kind of ongoing data that needs to be clarified. I'm just using this as an example. So at age six months, it was said to be mild. I report here the cardiomyopathy was stable. At age nine, it was said to be um, cardiomyopathy increasing subaortic membrane. I report here that growth hormone was started, excuse me, growth hormone was begun here, had been BC'd. These are just shorthand. I'm just trying to give you a visual for what I was doing. Rhabdo was occurred at age three years, uh, treatment with uh, rubamycin, the tumor occurred. Again, this is just to give you a visual of what I did patient by patient. Here's another patient here who had um, LVH at age four months, was concentric. Growth hormone was begun here at age two. There was a slight increase. A pituitary adenoma occurred at this year growth hormone was continued. And for each of these things, I can't tell you how important it is that although I respect parent self-reporting, I absolutely must get confirmation and endpoints with echoes and uh, cardiology data. 